welcome Ian and Lachazar to the podcast. Um, we're really happy to have you both on board today to talk about the science of marketing. Um, and I thought we could start with just a quick self-introduction for our listeners um, to give them a sense of who you are, what you do, and a bit of your background. Those would like to say hi to the audience, uh, which are listening to us on uh, their the various pod, uh, podcast platforms or watching us on, on YouTube. And uh, I would like to add that uh, we're delighted to be with you here today. Thanks for hosting us, Jake. My name is uh, Lachazar Ivanov, and uh, I'm a marketing consultant, and I focus on strategy, research, and communications. I also have an uh, academic background uh, prior to doing this. I did a PhD in marketing uh, at the European University of Adrian in Frankfurt, other Germany. And prior to the PhD, I work at, uh, uh, in social in, in social media marketing and uh, search engine marketing uh, in the Berlin startup sector. Okay, I'll go. So I'm, I'm Ian Pritchard. I'm uh, losing its funny lighting. It is nighttime here. So I'm in Melbourne, Australia. Um, so I, I, I'm a advertising planner um, uh, by trade. Uh, also, um, author of three books. The latest one was just came out. I'll maybe get to plug it at the end. <laughs> but uh, please, please do. Yeah, please and do. so uh, yeah, uh, myself and Lachis are. I guess we sort of met. Um, uh, you know what he didn't explain his his PhD that he wrote. A lot was you know con- connected to marketing science. It was also um, heavily um, uh, um, exploring the uh, applied evolutionary psychology which is big passion of mine i think that you know that's how we sort of connected with those two things marketing science and the human science uh and and you know putting them together um so yeah i've been in the business you know about you know too long really to uh, uh to mention i'll give away uh the age but uh yeah that's uh yeah introduction Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and I thought we could sort of kick off with a, a kind of a, a general question, but one that kind of comes up and is hotly debated um, is, is sort of the myths surrounding marketing and kind of in your opinion, Lachazar, what are, what are some of those common myths that so many people seem to get wrong about this topic? Uh, there, there are too many, Jake, and I believe we, if we can do a, a whole separate episode uh, around this topic, but uh, I will mention two or three things, and we'll begin with something that's, uh, uh, I believe, no one else talks about, uh, and, I, and it's dear to my heart, and it's uh, the very notion that uh, some people are arguing for uh, staying small as a brand, as from not growing, for staying niche. And uh, the fact that uh, you don't need to grow your brand, that's something that's uh, out there and people that are, have significant stance and are, uh, represent the face of marketing, like Seth Godin, for example, would uh, tell you that you should be looking for your minimal viable audience. And I don't want to misquote him, so uh, he defines it as uh, the smallest number of people that can sustain you in your work. And uh, I believe that uh, this sets sets you up uh, as a company, no matter the sector that you work in, uh, uh, for failure. or And it sets you up for unreasonable expectations uh, from your customers. So th- he's not the, 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 the only author. There are uh, other authors that would uh, say that you need only the thousand true fans to exist as a company. But uh, this is uh, very deleterious thinking can, can lead to bad results. And by bad results, I mean... Uh, to your company going uh, bankrupt uh, in a short period of time. We're in marketing and uh, what we should be doing is uh, growing revenue and thereby growing market share because this helps the companies to in their chances to survive. It's a probabilistic game. The marketing is a game of numbers. And uh, the more customers you have, the higher uh, your chances are for them to uh, become repeat customers and uh, to ensure your revenue in a given period. So this would be one that I would start with. And uh, yeah. uh, I think, you know, the, 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 uh, Seth, the Seth Gordon well, thing, just to sort of chip in, I think 
you know, yep. the, when when he, when he came out with that sort of statement, you know, I think he was he was sort of talking to people like authors or musicians or you know one person operations, you know, and it probably does make sense, uh, you know, a little bit to that. But the problem is people picked up the wrong end of the stick uh, and thought that this right. was some big statement about marketing in general, you know, when really, you know, it, you know, it wasn't. So slight defense of mm. Seth Godin there. It's more, you know, things become a myth because, because, you know, that, you know, lots of people start to believe it and apply it in the wrong mm. uh, in the wrong situation. You know? That's very very true. Yeah, I think it was actually possibly even Kevin Kelly who came up with the thousand true fans. He's a kind of yeah, web, so. web 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 yeah. guy. I think you're right, actually. Yeah. Silicon Valley. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with you guys. But uh, what's what's more, and uh, this is something that uh, has came up with uh, within my work with. Uh, Younger companies, especially the ones that are in the tech sector uh, or, or in bit bit sector for for that matter, out of companies, believe uh, that uh, uh, it's only from the tactical mix. It's only product that they should uh, focus on, uh, and uh, this could be sometimes to the detriment of other tactical areas like messaging, for example. And it's uh, of paramount importance that if you happen to have a good product that you tell your customers about it and create uh, demand for it because there's a saying uh, that a great product uh, will sell itself. It's not true. Mm -hmm. And maybe related to this uh, third point, uh, and probably this would uh, come up later uh, again uh, in this discussion is uh, the work of uh, Field and Binet uh, on the long and the short. Too many companies uh, for the past decade or so have been focusing on the short this means, uh, uh, for the listeners, just to explain it uh, on short-term conversions and not uh, working on uh, building up uh, demand. Because uh, if you think about uh, revenue and how it's structured, where it comes from, it's uh, there are two these two variables that you can work on. You should uh, have the customers or potential customers as many as them as possible, and you have to try to convert as many as them as possible. And by the multiplication of uh, those two variables, you end up with your sales result. Too many companies are focusing only on short-term uh, results and uh, plainly converting customers. And the thing with uh, those, this kind of thinking is that uh, it does not add up, so it does not increase uh, your revenue for the next period. So uh, you might have some 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 conversions in this period, but uh, they, uh, as, as long as you stop doing uh, your short-term activity, it will disappear. And uh, here I would like to give the word to, to my colleague Ian, Ian uh, because I believe it, this, this idea about uh, uh, companies forgetting uh, demand generation and uh, focusing solely on, on demand fulfillment is uh, at the heart of his uh, book, Where Did It All Go Wrong? So, Ian, where, where, where did it all go wrong? Yeah. Well, it's funny, you know, It's it, I, when I wrote that, that was 2017, I already thought maybe I, maybe I was a bit late to the party, you know, because it was definitely a discussion that was going on, you know, but, but it's kind of, you know, five years, six years later, and it's, not, it's not, nothing's changed. It's not got, got any better, you know, so it, it starts to look more like prophecy, you know. But... Um, yeah. I'll tell you one thing that I'm particularly skeptical about uh, just now, which is the current flavor of the month, is uh, attention metrics. So I don't know if you've been following that. Um, you know, there's a few firms have popped up. You know, sort of um, using eye tracking software yes. yeah. uh, and thing, and, and calling it and call it calling it measuring attention. You know, yep. which. You know, anyone, anyone with a basic understanding of human sort of psychology would know that just because eyeballs are looking at something doesn't mean to say there's any attention uh, going mm -hmm. on. So I think, you know, it's starting from a pretty faulty premise uh, mm -hmm. and then they run with it. And there's all kinds of, there's all kinds of strange uh, assertions being made. Like, for instance, you need to look at something for 2.5 seconds for it to be encoded to memory. 
which is just complete nonsense. There, you know, there's absolutely no evidence to support that claim at all. You know, and I've yep. talked to neuroscientists and I've talked, you know, uh, people who measure these things, and they're all going, well, you know, what are you talking about? So, <clears throat> you know, I think that's something current that has become quite popular that is grounded in just, you know, fanciful kind of uh, things that sort of sound good, you know. I think, mm. you know, there's definitely, what I would agree with them is that there's some media vehicles are better quality than others, you know, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, uh, example I always give when I'm talking about this is, uh, and you'll remember this, like in London a couple of years ago when KFC ran out of chicken. You know, uh, they yeah. could have emailed all of their mailing lists and apologised, but they didn't. They took out a full-page ad in the Evening Standard because people are quite good intuitive media planners, and you know, and they know that that was expensive. You know, so there's a um, the message could be trusted uh, a little bit. You know because of that. So that's an yeah. example of using the quality of media as a kind of costly signaling okay. type, type, type of thing. Um, so, yeah, so there's some, you know, the attention metrics thing, you know, there's based on some half truths, um, mm. but, um, but the whole eye tracking thing is just, is just sort of nonsense, you know? So I think, uh, that's, that's a, a current myth, you know, that I think, um, you know, more people, um, you know, because, you know, I'm not the only one that's skeptical, you know, so we need some more voices, you know, to keep that thing in check, you know, not not in, not to sort of, you know, you don't want to sort of, um, you know, make it personal or anything. It's not to do with that, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I think it's coming from, they're well-intentioned, you know, because obviously, you know, there's so much poor quality media, particularly on that line, that something needs to be. I just don't think that that's it. You know, I think that they're, they're measuring something and calling it attention, but it's not really attention. Attention happens in the mind, you know, not in the eyeballs. Well, a quick addition. Uh, I, I, I read your criticism and I completely agree with you. I, I just wanted to add something to this uh, when it comes to the technologically aided uh, measurement of uh, marketing effectiveness. Uh, the same, I would state, is true for uh, the firms that uh, use uh, facial encoding and uh, facial metrics uh, to uh, claim that uh, they're measuring emotion in advertising. Mm -hmm. So whether you mm -hmm. squint your eyes or or, or, or you have a smile and uh, they would call it, okay, this is happiness, this is uh, yeah. boredom or, or whatever. Yeah. But it's, again, you know, with that, you know, it's kind of, there's a half truth to it, you know, it's, as long as you think that kind of Western expressions of emotion are universal, right? Now, emotions are universal. Every, you know, everyone feels sadness or elation mm -hmm. or uh, fear but it may be expressed in a different way. It's the same as, it's like language, you know? You mm -hmm. know, we'll say the same things, but we talk different languages, you know? And so there's a different mm -hmm. visual language for emotions, you know? I mean, I think what you said at the start, when you say, like, what are the biggest myths? is how, It's hard to know when to stop, really, because there's, there's, you know, there are so many. Um, <laughs> good job we're here. I, th I think it's probably a, a general kind of observation about the... The topic isn't it that there's that there are a lot of um, new ideas that are introduced that don't have much substance behind them um, and hence yeah. you guys having that evidence-based approach because there is a lot of talk about yeah. all these different technologies but most of them don't don't hold water and maybe that's why there's some, yeah. some criticism um of 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 the profession yeah. i suppose um i was gonna say you get everyone gets carried away with with uh, I mean, the other thing that's current is the whole sort of Ritson versus Sharp debate, you know, on, on distinctiveness versus differentiation, which is just a non-topic, you know. It's kind of they're just different words, kind of for the same thing. Um, and you know, do we need really need to waste well, time on those kind of semantics? Yeah, you? yeah no, I mean, we're, that's actually a good, good, good question to ask because I think 
was talking specifically about mm -hmm. the, the differentiation versus distinctiveness debate. And um, I suppose first, first of all, to explain to anyone listening who might not understand what those two things are um, and, and why perhaps it's sure. a bit of a, oh, a false dichotomy. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's uh, surely a false dichotomy, and I'd uh, uh, be happy to provide some uh, some meat uh, to, to 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 the whole concept. Uh, and uh, uh, so, distinctiveness is, is uh, basically about the question: Do the customers know that it's you? Uh, is that this kind of uh, that this communication or advertisement or whatever is coming from you? Can they? rightly identify the source let me repeat this do they know it's you uh which is the starting point uh, and if they can't then you've already lost the game and uh differentiation comes at uh, a second step which is uh about the question what are your values and what do you stand for uh, compared to other competing uh, competing brands uh, in the category Mm -hmm. So these uh, two are uh, important, but uh, you first have to nail down uh, distinctiveness so that uh, people know that it's your brand and it's uh, not somebody else's brand. Because there's nothing uh, worse than uh, running a huge campaign on an expensive beat on TV, beat uh, uh, in on, on the radio or, or a full page magazine ad uh, where the consumer who is consuming this kind of content uh, would not be able to recognize that it's your brand. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, what can happen is uh, that uh, uh, maybe they can identify the category correctly. So maybe you're doing uh, advert uh, mm -hmm. advertising for the whole category, which is uh, not always bad if you're the category leader anyway. So they will naturally come 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 to you. But uh, sometimes if you're if if you're not the category leader, sometimes uh, what happens with consumers is they might believe that uh, the advertisement is for your biggest competitor in the, in the field and mistakenly uh, remember it as an uh, advertisement for your competitor. And uh, I like to give uh, always an example. It uh, also happens to people. Sometimes you would uh, meet somebody or see somebody and uh, you would not be able to recognize if this is the same person the next time you see them or you, you could mistake them for, for somebody else. So this is distinctiveness. Uh, you have to know, yeah, consumers have to know that, that it's your, in the, funnily in the German uh, financial world, uh, there are two guys uh, that are really prominent uh, on YouTube. The one is uh, uh, Dr. Andreas Beck and the other one is Dr. Gerd Komar. And uh, once they appeared in a video together and uh, one of the top comments uh, below the video was uh, by a guy saying that uh, I always thought that these two guys are the same person. And so, uh, <laughs> al al although you know, they do not look uh, like each yeah. other and uh, they all, both of them have different funds that you can invest in, if you can't uh, tell the one from the other, then it's uh, hard to... Uh, in investing the proper fund <laughs> that you yeah. wish to, to invest in. And the second uh, um, concept, uh, as, as we let we mention, is uh, differentiation. And uh, uh, we in our work uh, like to talk about relative differentiation, which means relative to your competitors. And mm -hmm. uh, here it is important to note that uh, no brands own uh, a, a single attribute for example, uh, in the UK, we have the Audi brand of supermarkets that's considered to be cheap or more economically affordable, but it does not own the uh, the, 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 the cheap attribute. Uh, it's only cheaper compared to its uh, competitors. So mm -hmm. this goes uh, a little bit against uh, prior uh, ideas that uh, folks like uh, Russell Reeves have uh, established, like uh, the USPs. There's nothing unique about uh, uh, the values that uh, your brand possess. Uh, can, can we add in that the mindset mix? Of, of consumers? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this rightly belongs to the mid. So, in the minds of consumers, um, uh, different brands in different categories could uh, 
could uh, share share attributes, but some some brands could be uh, the more of some attributes than others. So one bank could be, I don't know, more safer than others, or 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 mm-hmm. in a cert- certain smartphone manufacturer could be uh, a little bit more innovative than another one. But that's mm-hmm. that's basically wraps wraps it up no. uh, when it comes to that's not really differentiation. You know, a bank is a bank, right? And all banks are the same because they all provide credit cards, they all provide insurance products, they all provide uh, uh, mortgages, you know, or whatever. You know, and it's 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 table stakes to be a bank. That's what what you have to do. So they're completely undifferentiated in that respect. Now, some might be a more premium service than others, and some, you know, one's a red bank, one's the yellow bank, one's the the blue bank you know uh so mm-hmm. is that is that distinctiveness or is that, that you know you know but, but you don't want to be so differentiated in your category that you don't look like you're actually in the category that's not how people buy you know? but they, they, this is you know uh uh differentiation on on the uh when when we look at uh, the tactical plane uh here you're referring to product but uh they could yes. indeed provide the same products but uh, they could differ in their messaging and thereby in the Associations that are uh, uh, built in the minds of the consumers uh, with regards to those banks, for, for instance. Mm. And uh, mm. I was reading in one of your post lectures are um, the other week, and uh, there was a, this discussion about um, something that I actually hadn't ever heard of before. Embarrassingly, um, but it is, is really interesting. And in it's called category entry points. Um, can can you kind of explain? what exactly those are and, and why they're important? Uh, thanks for the question, Jake. Surely this is also something uh, or a topic or a notion that's been uh, heavily pushed out by Byron Sharp uh, and the uh, folks uh, at the Ehrenberg Bus Institute. So category entry points, the way they define them are reasons or occasions for consumers to buy a product. Or in other words, um, these are the thoughts that uh, buyers have uh, when they transition into buying from the category. So think about questions like uh, uh, why uh, consumers buy the category, when and how do they buy the category, and like how do they want to feel when they buy the category, and uh, uh, with what other uh, products is the purchase related, and uh, with uh, whom do you buy from the category? Just to give some examples, uh, like uh, if, it kind of builds if, on, uh, you know, the, there's the sort of five W's framework, which sort of precedes yeah. that. I can't remember what the origins of that, that, but it's like why, where, when, what, and it kind of builds right. builds on that, right? Yeah. So you got those, mm-hmm. but then, as Lachis said, you've got with whom, with what, how does it feel, you know? So. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the idea, uh, I think with Ehrenberg Bass, obviously, because they're not, uh, you know, the, the philosophy there is not is not big on overly targeting particular groups mm-hmm. or whatever. You know, it's like targeting the, mm-hmm. whole, uh, the whole market. But what you can mm-hmm. target is are those usage situations. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can be quite specific right. with your targeting around that. Um, right. You know, because the idea is there and you can be targeted, but you don't sacrifice reach. The the framework was developed for different purposes, but uh, uh, we argue that uh, it's uh, pretty much valuable for for targeting with the idea being that uh, and for segmentation, uh, which is the first uh, part Mm -hmm. prior to to, to the targeting effort. So uh, indeed you can uh, and you should target all segments uh, in, in, in the category, but you can use the category entry points uh, framework to uh, segmentize the category, or in other words, to divide the what appears to be a heterogeneous market into smaller mm-hmm. homogeneous groups. So uh, for instance, uh, if we talk about uh, the question of uh, uh, how do they want to feel, if we go back to our example for, uh, from from the bank, if, if your bank uh, an investment product, uh, you know that uh, we, you would like to have certain amount of uh, certainty and safety, uh, but uh, there's variance in there. So uh, 
some people could be more risk tolerant than some people could be less risk tolerant. It's, and uh, a kind of uh, segmentation exercise takes place uh, rightly prior to uh, the purchase of uh, such a product where the bank quirks will give you a survey and you answer questions regarding your, your risk tolerance, whether it's a valid approach or not. Uh, it's, it's a metaphor. <laughs> Another another story, but uh, then they then you will be uh, put in a category or in a segment, uh, for instance, uh, where you be together with other consumers that are more risk averse, less risk averse, or risk seeking, and you will be uh, recommended a different product or slightly different product. problem. So the, the the whole idea being is that uh, the whole market is covered. Everybody uh, gets their different kind of product or different kind of messaging or or different price uh, for, for that matter. I guess the, the question here is, you know, why why is market segmentation helpful for the, the short term conversions bit, but not so for the, the long term brand building? Yeah, there's a pretty uh, simple and straightforward answer to this uh, question, Jake, uh, because uh, long term brand building uh, uh, benefits from broad audience targeting. That's uh, what uh, the research by uh, Les and Peter is uh, showing, and uh, when you think about it, it makes perfect sense because uh, uh, a brand could not mean a thousand different things to a thousand different uh, people. Inherently, it, it does because that that's uh, uh, because everybody has a different uh, brain and mind. But uh, it's a, a brand is something that should uh, gather people uh, around it, and uh, it should uh, represent some some kind of uh, common and shared knowledge. I was going to say um, uh, some segment. To, you know, I'm, I th- you know, some people would say don't segment at all. There's other people that go way over the top. You know, with like a hundred segments with like, you know. <laughs> these esoteric kind of names for mm. for people you know so i think there's a sort of middle way which is you segment as much as is necessary and try and keep it to as few you know as you can you know i mean you know one of the firm that i've been working with who are who who make legal software ai legal software you know mm-hmm. and uh and basically there's two segments you know which is they have corporate uh, legal professionals inside companies and and law firms, and that's mm-hmm. those are the segments. You know, so mm-hmm. um, as few as 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 uh, as you can get away with, you know. Um, yeah. uh, and there are, there are good cool. reasons for this. Uh, first of all, as, as I said, uh, the brand, the whole overall experience should be uh, the same for all segments. Even, even those two that you mentioned should have. Uh, same basic understanding uh, of the company, what it stands for. This way, the long-term brand building efforts uh, should be based uh, on, on broad targeting. So everybody in, in the cat, who buys the category should uh, be in there. And uh, sometimes, as you said, uh, uh, it is uh, functional differences of some sort that uh, will determine the level of uh, segmentation that would be, as we argue and we suggest, should be used for uh, short-term sales activation. So in, in the case that you described, uh, then they might have a different approach uh, when they speak to clients and, and uh, a little, maybe a little bit uh, slightly changed uh, offering uh, for those two uh, segments. And there is also another reason that you should try and do probably less segmentation than you would initially go for. And that's the reason why is uh, for every segment, the idea behind segmentation is that you have to uh, do some changes uh, in your tactical mix. So it could be product, it could be the price, it could be the distribution or, or, or the communication, and uh, which uh, inadvertently is related to more costs to the company. So the more segments uh, that you have, the more resources you have to put in to uh, augment the tactical mix uh, for this particular segment. Do, in, if you do your no. category entry points properly, then the segmentation takes care of itself, you know, because the then customers self-select, you know, because yeah. they know their when, why, where, with whom, with what. You don't, you don't, you know, that makes the segmentation happen without you having to do anything. Um, you know, yeah. if you can get just, that just, right. Just to, 
just to wrap it up, uh, there is a limited number of segments that can be exploited for profit. Sometimes uh, if you go for too many segments, it's become unprofitable for the company. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And yeah, Ian, I'm sort of curious and intrigued by your your books that you've written and published. Um, I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit about each of the books and um, maybe some of the listeners might be interested. Yeah, sure. Well, I'll try and I won't hog the whole show talking about it, but there's three three now. First one, which is the one that, that people might have heard of because it was a sort of surprise hit. Uh, it was called Where Did It All Go Wrong? Um, and it's it was kind of... Um, Came out in 2017, just at its sort of peak of uh, sort of, you know, hyper targeted um, internet advertising and everything. And it just had, I, you know, and I, I was part of it. There's a, there's a sort of little, um, quite an old fashioned email mailing list called Project VRM, which I was part of. Um, so people like Doc Searles and Don Marty were on that, and everything that there was was sort of talking about it. And that, I was influenced by that. And it started off; it was really just three or four articles that I'd written that seemed to knit together. So I thought, actually, I could put those together, then write around it, and then I've got a book. So I thought that would be it. Uh, but then I sort of um, so that that was like surprisingly uh, like sold heaps, you know, and. Uh, so I thought, aha, I'd better do another one. So, <laughs> uh, so the the other one um, I wrote it was it, um, it was called "Shot by Both Sides," and it was a bit like a sort of, um, you know, when you're kind of neither in one place or the other. Where there was, you know, I kind of felt like there was a lot of people who were misty eyed for the golden age of seventies advertising and wanted to go back to that. And then you got the other sort of digital zealots on the other side, and I thought I don't feel part of either of those groups, you know. So, um, so that was that one. And the new one's called "If There's a Hell Below, We're All Gonna Go," which is uh, after the Curtis Mayfield song. And that's um, that's sort of the final part of the trilogy, really, just sort of uh, um, you know wrapping up all of my sort of thoughts on that. There's a big piece on attention metrics and everything. It's basically just me complaining right. about things. You know, so, uh, um, so it's a, it's a niche, uh, a niche uh, category. You know, you don't, it's not like Simon Sinek or something. You don't buy those books to learn how to do something. You, you buy them because you have some sort of deep, uh, perhaps hidden self-loathing. Uh, and, uh, you know, <laughs> And there's someone else out, out there, right? So, um, yeah, so that's it. You know, it's just a, it's a bit of fun, creative outlet, I guess. Um, yeah. Uh, the new one is my favorite of all. I've got the, the ghost of Dostoevsky is like the co-author. Um, so uh, he's in there commenting on stuff as well. So it's, uh, yeah, can't wait to see sounds the movie great. of it. Yeah. That sounds great. And that's out now. Is that right? It's out, it's out now, yeah, on Amazon Worldwide and then discerning bookstores. Fantastic. And then, yeah, kind of on the topic of books, we kind of always like to sort of wrap it up with some book recommendations. I know I'm probably putting you on the spot, but um, listeners often like to hear um, some of the recommendations from, from experts. And that, I guess aside from your books, Ian, are there any sort of books on yeah. the topic we talked about in general today? Um or not necessarily that. Any any books you really rate and recommend for people, yeah. people interested? I'm impressed to recommend like one book. I get coming back to what we talked about at the beginning. I mean, you know, one of the things I'm really interested in is th this application of evolutionary psychology in mar in, in marketing, and uh, and there's a psychologist called Jeffrey Miller who wrote a book yep. uh, called Spent, which is about about the evolutionary sort of basis of consumption is quite entertaining but very informative as well so that's that's the one that i recommend for people who want to get interested in that strand of you know that, of, yeah marketing on my list that one um and, and how about you dr uh, is there anything that spring springs to mind for you sure i would uh yeah i'll, I'll join uh, ian's recommendation for for uh jeffrey's book uh, uh for sure, and uh, just want to put some 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 something intriguing, and uh, that is that uh, uh, 
Jeffrey is also uh, known for his work on the evolutionary origins of humor. And uh, you can definitely find this in, in, in the book and his uh, other articles. And uh, funnily enough, uh, my uh, PhD, part of it, uh, one of the articles that I wrote was uh, on humor and uh, its evolutionary origins and how men and women react to different uh, types of uh, humor. So Jeffrey and I connected over uh, our common interest in uh, humor and uh, and its evolutionary origins. So yeah, definitely check uh, uh, Jeffrey's book. And uh, when it comes to marketing, there are books that uh, have been already mentioned uh, in this episode. And uh, for those who haven't read uh, Sharp, uh, do go read uh, Byron Sharp. Uh, How Brands Grow is the name of, of the book, uh, uh, which is popular, but uh, I believe that uh, more people could profit uh, from it. We've also mentioned the work of uh, uh, Peter Field and Binet, The Long and the Short. It's a very short booklet. Uh, do find it's like 30 pages if uh, or, or so, if memory serves me right. Uh, uh, yeah, this one is also a recommendation for the folks that are interested in marketing. And uh, uh, when it comes to evolution and how people behave and uh, what drives us, I would also definitely recommend uh, Behave uh, by Robert Sapolsky. It's a thick one, very extensive, but it's also very well-researched and uh, well-written. So yeah, this would be my recommendations uh, when it comes to the human side of, of things. And for the listeners out there, I do urge you to, to read something about uh, human nature and the human condition if you're interested in marketing and advertising um, because the great advertisers have always known this. It is, it is insight into human nature that is the key to the communicator skill. It's uh, by Bill Bernbach. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's very true, isn't it? Like, uh, intuitively, the best advertisers are the ones that pick up on the human truths. Well, now, thank you so much, both of you, for your, your recommendations and for being with us today. I put all of the books and articles referenced in the, in the show notes um, so people can go out and buy buy your books, Ian. Yeah, just a big, big thank you to you both for your time. Thanks for thanks for having us.